I am Michal Koukny. Uh, if you don't know me, I work in the core kernel team. I work on the stuff related to C groups. And today I have a talk which is called Throttling with CPU Controller. But actually, I'm not sure if the name is appropriate. I just merged various ideas I had. So you will see, and I will see how it turns out. Uh, the motivations I had for this um, was an interesting case uh, that was motivated by a bug that we have observed. Uh, what happens when we attempt to throttle a process or workload that has spin lock? Uh, yeah, just to be sure, spin lock is a synchronization primitive. And uh, the important point here is that spin lock uh, uses CPU, uh, CPU time when it is waiting. So that was an interesting thing what happens uh, when it's wrong. Then I also wanted to learn some of the queuing theory because it seems like it's a uh, already well mapped area and sometimes it might be useful, I thought. So that was another point. Uh, I, I also, also thought that if I somehow parse this information and put it into a good form or good form, uh, into unified form, it may be useful for others. And also it fits into my private series on controllers that I am maintaining here on Labs conference. Uh, previously, I had talked about memory control, IO control. Now today it's about CPU control and that structure is, the structure of these talks is actually uh, quite similar. So today uh, I will sh start with slightly with explaining quickly how the particular part of the throttling of the control works. Then I will present the some the, uh, conclusions from the queuing theory that I, I found useful. Then and then I uh, that's. Uh, what is the similar structure with uh, previous years is that I did some experiments. Uh, so I described how my setup was and then um, will show you the results. And that would be end of the talk. So uh, I would start with talking about the structures that are relevant for throttling. So the basic uh, structure in the CPU control is a task group uh, that represents uh, C group as uh, users know it from the from the user interface, and uh, each uh, task group has associated uh, some other data structures that are allocated for each CPU. Uh, mainly, there is a CFS run queue that represents the run queue of uh, the task group on the given CPU. And then there is a SCAD entity that represents the given task group uh, on its parent uh, run queue, CFS run queue. So here is a diagram. Uh, it's, uh, it's uh, always confusing for me uh, to, to know what, what is associated with what. So uh, this here we have a simple hierarchy. There is the root C group and it has two uh, descendant C group, C group one and C group two. And uh, as, uh, if you look at the C group number one, so it has uh, these these two or sorry uh, these couples they are yeah, they are coupled the sket entity on cpu0 is coupled with cfs run queue on cpu0 and they have different roles uh, the sket entity of the c group 1 actually is queued in the cfs run queue of its parent that is root c group and uh, it is associated uh, with the cfs run queue uh, that represents the c group number 1 itself so uh, this way uh, we can join the levels of the tree, and yeah, uh, the, the bottom level or uh, at the bottom level uh, there are there are individual tasks. The tasks are actually also skit entities, but I, here I marked them with number T, uh, sorry, with letter T, uh, and they are they are on the, in the leaves uh, in the leaf cubes uh, for simplicity here, uh, and. Uh, so, so what, what is important here that actually uh, each CPU has its own uh, tree of uh, uh, CFS run queues. And uh, 
Yeah, the entities. Uh, for, it means that, for example, the, C, uh, the tasks tasks uh, would mi could migrate between the uh, CPUs, but if they are stable, uh, so they would stay on the one CPU that would be uh, they would be on the same CFS run queue. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, mm -hmm. uh, this is. What I wanted to say, yeah, so it's, it's the tree. Uh, yeah, uh, just here at the top, uh, I forgot to say um, that the root C group is has not associated scat entity because uh, its root C group is not to be scheduled by anything. Uh, so it's where the CF, CFS uh, scheduler starts the iteration and actually starts with the scat entities on the first level of the CFS run queues associated with the root C group. Uh, so uh, yeah, and the so the scat entities can be put or taken off the CFS run queues depending whether they are runnable. So we are talking about CPU control. That means we have perhaps some CPU intensive workload. So uh, yeah, uh, all scat entities would be uh, most of the time runnable. Uh, but uh, yeah, when the, when the throttling comes in, uh, the, we can have a runnable. CFS run queue, and uh, because it has run out of its quota, it uh, would not be queued onto its parent uh, CFS run queue, but it would be temporarily put onto the throttled CFS run queue list, where it uh, must uh, wait some wait some time until uh, the quota is uh, again refilled. So uh, this is uh, this is just uh, for the relevant data structures uh, uh, about the refilling. We will talk about it uh, right ahead. Uh, so uh, the input uh, from the user for the throttling uh, is a period and quota that, that uh, relates to a single C group. The period uh, basically says, uh, or from the user point of view, it says you have. Uh, this quota of CPU time and uh, every period you can use at most uh, this amount of CPU time. How did I implement it then in the kernel? Uh, there is a, a CAT CFS period timer that uh, is triggered every period time and it refills a uh, whole group's bucket of uh, runtime. It's important that this uh, is shared. Uh, for the all CFS run queues of all CPUs, uh, so it's a uh, like global bucket. But then, uh, individual CFS run queues still have no runtime. But when they are in queued, when a CFS run queue is runnable, so it pulls. Uh, it pulls. It's, it, it's not. It's not distributed uh, from the top, but it is clearly like pulling the time from the from this group bucket. And uh, usually, uh, like usually. Uh, it's uh, five milliseconds. It's uh, configurable via that CTL uh, option. And uh, I, then, when a task that was running in uh, on when a task of a CFS run queue when it was preempted, so uh, it's th then it che it's checking the quota of the CFS run queue whether it was uh, consumed or not. And in the case it was consumed, the CFS run queue would be dequeued from its parent and it will be put on the throat list we have saw previously. Uh, and th th there are several uh, other points uh, where the quota is checked and also the checking is usually bundled with the pooling. So it tries to pull this this five millisecond slice and uh, then, then the tasks can run uh, under this uh, throttle CFS run U. Uh, then there is one important function, distribute CFS runtime, uh, that is run after the, the timer refills the bucket, and it uh, distributes. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, it uh, it actually looks at the throttle list, and uh, if it uh, realizes that there is enough uh, enough. Uh, uh, runtime uh, in the bucket, so it uh, takes the CFS run queues off the list, but it does not uh, uh, does not give them any 
uh, runtime. Uh, this is, as I said previously, uh, this must be done uh, by the run queue when, it's, when it is and queued and it pulls uh, this uh, slice. And uh, yeah, the, the CF, uh, it can happen that, yeah, so uh, I, um, normally uh, the well, during the NQ moment, there will be the, this pool of five milliseconds, and uh, it, uh, the task would uh, be uh, most likely preempted before it runs out, run out, consumes all of these uh, five milliseconds, uh, or, or it can just uh, yield uh, without preemption. Uh, but uh, if there is not preemption, for example, in the kernel, uh, it can run longer than this amount of time, and it can overrun the runtime, and uh, that's accounted for also in the function distributes CFS runtime that actually uh, also like repays the debt. So it uh, it uh, it it uh, takes the runtime from the bucket and uh, uh, puts it uh, to pay the debt. So uh, that means that then there is less for the others uh, for the other CFS run queues. So it it is conservative. Uh, Another point is relevant here uh, that uh, when the quota is not spent in the given period, uh, it's lost. Uh, uh, unless there is a special option uh, or new option, I would say, uh, burst that allows some uh, yeah, amount of uh, quota to be transferred between the periods. But that's relatively new stuff. And also, yeah, so that was uh, unused uh, quota from the whole group, uh, but sometimes it can happen that uh, the individual CFS run queue, it took its slice, that five hundred seconds, and it did not consume it all. So there is also a uh, asynchronous timer that checks uh, CFS run queues that have no tasks on them, so they perhaps will not consume this remaining uh, slice, and then uh, this uh, Remaining time is returned to the bucket. So, but this uh, within within the period. So that was uh, the quick explanation how the CPU throttling works. The important thing is here that there is the uh, period and quota, and then it's distributed in these slices to pair CPU uh, CFS run queues. Now. Uh, here is a survey question. I mentioned that there is the uh, throttle CFS RQ list where we put throttled uh, CFS run queues and then the th th timer function uh, takes them out when there is enough runtime for them. Now the question is, how should this uh, data structure behave? Uh, like, should we put it at the end and take it uh, from the other end, like the queue of FIFO, FIFO, or like a stack? So, and I, create now a poll, the, yeah, so the options, there are three options. Uh, yeah, uh, so A is FIFO, uh, B is LIFO, and C something else. And you should now see the voting buttons. So I will, uh, I will leave it running for a bit. Yeah. Um, so, as I said, uh, each uh, task group has a CFS rank queue for each CPU. So, if we have a big system with many CPUs, there would be, it can be up to number of CPUs, uh, CFS rank queues on this list. So, uh, yeah, uh, I, uh, I see, thank you, thank you. I uh, like that you are engaged. Uh, so I will publish the results now, and it should be visible. So most people uh, voted for A, that is a FIFO, FIFO, thank you. Uh, and uh, yeah, that is how it should behave. But historically, uh, it wasn't always FIFO for some reasons how this access to this data structure uh, has had to be synchronized. So it, at some point in time, it even behaved like a FIFO. So it means that if there was a low quota, uh, so only some few chosen CFS run queues at the top or at the bottom, uh, or perhaps at the top of the stack, uh, were, were enjoying uh, the, redistribu the distributed quota, and some other CFS run queues were starved at the bottom of the stack. Uh, so, and that, that could cause quite some troubles. 
Fortunately, uh, no such issues are currently tracked. Currently, I mean uh, C15 SP4 uh, kernel. So, so that was uh, yeah, uh, that was all about the CPU controller in this talk, and now uh, I move to the queuing theory. Uh, here is a picture of what is the basic abstraction used uh, in the cube theory. I, uh, mm, yeah, perhaps I think there must be someone who knows it. Uh, uh, yeah, for, for me, this was always uh, interesting. Uh, I've never had a course on it. Uh, so uh, yeah, apologies if, uh, if uh, I'm telling something uh, uh, obvious or well known. Uh, so as a refresher. Uh, we model it. We model uh, server, or actually, it's a, a multi-server. That's on the right side. We have C, C servers, and they have one shared queue on the input when the requests are coming. Uh, that's with the letter lambda. Uh, and uh, usually, uh, the, uh, the people uh, involved in the theory uh, use Kendall's notation, uh, which can consist of up to four numbers or variables that describe uh, the given uh, server model. So the first letter, it uh, tells us the distribution of times uh, between arrivals of the requests. And uh, the distribution, there are some uh, um, well-known names for this. So M means exponential, uh, because it actually means like memoryless, and that is exponential distribution. And D, deterministic, is a constant distribution. Uh, yeah, it's just uh, always the same uh, distance as the things between the arrivals. Uh, B is the distribution of the processing times because the server takes some time to process the request, and it is also a random variable that has a simple, a similar distribution. C, as I said, this is the number of the servers we can see here, and K, K uh, here in the picture is actually you know K minus C is uh, the capacity of the system of the requests that can be uh, uh, in the flight uh, in the system. Uh, so like for, for the for the reasons of the probability calculations, um, I, the K uh, accounts to the total number. So actually the length of the queue, the capacity of the queue is K minus C. And uh, yeah, uh, usually uh, the, uh, the convention is also that the, uh, uh, the mean arrival time uh, is denoted as lambda, and mean processing time of a single server here uh, is uh, denoted uh, mu, 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 the Greek letter mu. So now we have the terms. Uh, so now let's look at some pictures. Uh, pictures from vacation or uh, pictures from drawing uh, the, uh, the behavior of uh, these uh, systems. So the, the simplest system is uh, MM1, uh, which has exponential distributions both at the input and the processing times. And here, this is just to, to uh, get acquainted with the graphs that I use. So uh, beware, uh, that I used uh, logarithmic access uh, that's the first point. Uh, the latency is on the left axis. Uh, it's a uh, uh, latency is uh, oh, sorry sorry uh, uh, latency. Uh, no, I will start again. Uh, so on the x axis we have the arrival times, uh, their mean arrival time, and that uh, goes from zero to one. And it's uh, here simplified that the mean processing time is uh, one request per second. So that's why we can have this uh, unit uh, at the bottom as well. So the throughput actually scales uh, quite linear linearly uh, with the arrival. That's this diagonal line. And uh, latency, that is the time uh, from the issuing, issuing of the request until it's a, a completion. That's the purple line. And you see that uh, that the latency grows as uh, we increase uh, the arrival times. And actually, uh, in this model, uh, if the uh, arrivals are equal or even more than the uh, processing uh, rate, uh, the queue diverges. There is no finite number that could be assigned as an average number of the length of the queue. Or uh, the latency here, it's average, average. So this is uh, basically uh, to explain you uh, how uh, how this graph 
uh, is made and how it what's interesting in it that uh, now next picture uh, here is the model when we, instead of a single server behind one queue we have uh, C servers behind one queue uh, so again the slightly diagonal line is the throughput uh, we see that it scales but actually here the line means it's common for all the servers uh, so uh, if we have uh, for example the uh, c uh, if c is 8 so uh, of course uh, the throughput would end at uh, the point of era uh, mean arrival rate of eight requests per second because you see, can see uh, the queue again diverges uh, but what is interesting here in this plot is uh, that, uh, for example, we have uh, we have uh, four parallel servers, and uh, we can see that th yeah, there is some slight slight latency, uh, but it's not very big. Uh, but if so, it's this orange line. So, if, but if we double the number of servers, so we get on this yellow line, and if the arrival rate stays still the same, so we basically uh, resolve any latency at all because. Uh, there will be always three servers and uh, there will be no queuing. On the other hand, if we reduce the number to the half, uh, so we would be still at the arrival rate of four, uh, but we only have two servers. So, uh, so uh, sorry, uh, we would have four servers, the blue line. So it would be at the point of this uh, noon divergence and uh, uh, we are lost. Uh, so this is the model for MMC server. Now, so uh, the C uh, uh, was a finite number. Uh, so here is also for completeness <laughs> uh, mm infinity. Uh, that would be uh, if we had infinite number of servers. Actually, I, I kept the yeah, I kept the x-axis uh, with the rate up to sixty-four. But uh, if we have infinite number of servers, so it could uh, go to the right to the infinity, and we still would have a latency of one second. So um, we can imagine that this can be, for example, some very well scaling Kubernetes cluster uh, that has infinite number of servers available and there are no uh, shared components at all. Uh, no, this is uh, just for the completeness because now the inf interesting stuff comes now. Uh, these models, I told you, uh, they diverge uh, when the incoming rate equals the processing rate. And uh, we, we, we cannot calculate the length of the queue because uh, yeah, uh, it, uh, its limit its limit is infinite. Infinite. So what is more realistic is that we have uh, bounded queues. That's when we add the k uh, uh, k component uh, to the notation. So here k equals one. That means that we only have uh, one slot in our system, and uh, it means in the server, just in the server, the queue is empty. And we can see that's very it looks very good. I would take it uh, every time. The latency is always uh, one. It doesn't grow even if we increase the arrival rate. Uh, but uh, yeah. Like we see, there is some problem with the throughput at the bottom. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, with the throughput at the bottom, uh, that it actually does not scale as uh, nicely. And uh, uh, it, seems, uh, it seems like we don't process all of the incoming requests. And so here is on the next plot, it has, uh, I, I added it to the top plot. Uh, it, now it's uh, annotated on the right axis, it's the drop rate. So despite the, we have this nice uh, constant uh, latency, all requests, or <laughs> all served requests are served in a constant time, the drop rate actually <laughs> grows quite substantially. And uh, if we increase the incoming rate, uh, we <laughs> just, it's a good dropping machine. Uh, it uh, just loses requests. Uh, but latency is good. Uh, so uh, now here uh, again for the completeness, uh, we can look at the function uh, of uh, k, how it changes. Uh, so we can see if, if we increase uh, the length of the queue, uh, so uh, actually the latency gets worse. Uh, get, the latency gets worse. Uh, this uh, is called is a buffer bloat. Uh, so yeah, like the buffers, sometimes they are good, sometimes they are bad. Uh, they are bad because uh, or depends, depends, depends on the use case, of course, uh, because we have somehow helped with the drop rate. Uh, that's the dashed line at the background. So you can see that the dropping rate uh, is uh, lower, uh, but eventually it's still 
uh, if, if the system is overloaded, we still would be dropping eventually. Eventually, the, the queue fills and we will be dropping. Uh, so yeah, overloaded systems must drop requests. Uh, and yeah, the throughput, uh, yeah, we can see if we have longer queue, uh, we can scale linearly uh, as uh, the incoming queue uh, allows us uh, to uh, to have some yeah, uh, 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 margin uh, for the very very various times of the request. Uh, but if, if 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 the incoming rate is bigger, uh, we cannot grow our throughput be, uh, above above the capacity of our server, the processing time. So, uh, uh, yeah, all, uh, interesting thing also what I wanted to point out here. Uh, when if we have these uh, long queues, uh, so uh, the the latency actually doesn't grow if we uh, if we increase uh, the arrival rate. Uh, so the latency would just uh, attain the time that we need to pass through the queue because the queue is finite. So we have uh, uh, like finite latency and it doesn't grow, uh, but uh, we increase the dropping rate. Uh, so it it makes uh, arguing about the system sometimes uh, simpler if we know that the successfully successfully handled requests would have uh, some bound on the latency. Now, that was uh, the superficial queuing theory. Now, my experiment. Uh, so, uh, the server. Uh, yeah, <laughs> previously, I had uh, this uh, abstract server. So now I uh, created, uh, <laughs> it's actually bare metal. It was bare metal server, but then I had a container. Uh, so in the container, I had Apache web server. Uh, the, it was uh, a 15.4 based uh, uh, sorry, 15.4 base image, and it was running on Tumbleweed host. Uh, the machine uh, had uh, altogether uh, 48 uh, independent uh, uh, CPUs, or independent, I mean, like uh, threads of execution. And uh, for this Apache e server, uh, I did some uh, changes from the default configuration uh, for the purposes of my experiment. So. I aligned the number of the workers with the number of available uh, you know, physical threads on the machine uh, because yeah, I didn't want to have less uh, uh, to ex ex examine all the space and I didn't want to have more because uh, my intention was to have a heavy CPU uh, workload uh, so more request workers uh, wouldn't help uh, more request workers than uh, physical cpus wouldn't help me then listen backlog i i reduced it to number one that's the lowest number because i wanted actually to eliminate the effect of uh, this buffer broke uh, because that would mean for me i would have to uh, wait longer until some uh, requests uh, are still in the queue and uh, it uh, made the measurement uh, simpler and I changed the forking mode of the Apache from the default pre-fork mode to the threaded mode. I did that because I thought I will, uh, it would be quicker, uh, quicker, but <laughs> I, uh, not to start a process, uh, but just have threads. But uh, uh, it's not rigorous. Um, so that is about my server hardware. Uh, but OK, this Apache that's uh, just an infrastructure. So uh, I implemented uh, basically yeah, this dummy uh, dummy CGI module um, as a C program. So what it does, um, it uh, takes a lock, then it does some dummy CPU work. Uh, I here use some lock to ratio so that it's not all uh, not all work is uh, uh, locked or in the critical section. Then it did uh, some rest uh, of the parallel work. Uh, that was uh, that was also CPU work. Uh, the types of lock uh, that were taken, uh, yeah, this was use space implementation. Uh, so there were three three options: uh, no lock, so actually uh, uh, it would like run uh, everything in parallel. Uh, mutex lock, uh, that's the lock that uh, uh, is unscheduled uh, when it's waiting for. When it's waited for, and uh, spin lock, uh, as I explained in the beginning, uh, the interesting one uh, that uh, takes CPU time uh, when it's waiting. Um, 
And uh, a similar, uh, when I presented the graphs from the theory, I did it also in my setup uh, so that the uh, workers on the, uh, the, the workers of the server uh, process one request per second on average. Uh, but yeah, uh, yeah, on average, I will get to that perhaps later. So that was the server. Now, uh, my client, uh, because uh, yeah, uh, you also need some clients. So actually, I realized uh, that HTTP benchmarking is a very wide area that people do it a lot, perhaps because of various APIs. So there are lots of benchmarking tools, HTTP benchmarking tools uh, written in various languages, uh, but they have one uh, disadvantage for my use case. I wasn't able to find a tool uh, that could have controlled the incoming rate because all of these tools, they just try to saturate the server and feed as many requests as possible uh, before uh, the requests uh, uh, are dropped or not uh, responded uh, in timely fashion. Uh, so this so wouldn't work for my experiment when I wanted to examine the whole space or like the whole space, uh, but uh, like uh, going from the low load on the server uh, to the higher loads, so to see some change of the behavior. So eventually, uh, I chose one of these uh, uh, Plajora uh, tools uh, called Work, and uh, I did some modifications to it uh, so that I can control the arrival rate to the server. And I, I ran it on a different computer, uh, but it sh should not affect uh, should not affect my measurement because uh, yeah, the ping was under one millisecond. Uh, the request lasted uh, on average one second, uh, so that should not count that much. So mm -hmm. uh, now, what I thought about it, how it could be modeled. Mm. So uh, here we have, we have like three uh, three parts of the pipeline going from the left to the right. On the left-hand side, we have uh, the the network stack and uh, uh, input as part of the Apache uh, that is like parallelized. I assume there are no 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 critical sections there. Then there is this important critical section or important, the critical section that I have created uh, in my server uh, or in the CGI uh, uh, module. So uh, this is a critical section where everyone every request has uh, to be alone. And mm -hmm, thank you, I see. Uh, and uh, then there is the rest of the parallel work and then the net output. So we could think about the first uh, part, first component as uh, MMCK model uh, when we have the K with the bounded Q. Uh, then into the critical section, actually, uh, we could think about it about as MM1 uh, without any boundary because, uh, th because thanks to that, it comes through the first module. It would, re uh, it would restrict uh, the maximum uh, uh, rate at this boundary, uh, and similarly at this part. Uh, so this would work nice. Uh, there is actually Burke's theorem that says that if we have uh, okay, I'm not sure about MMCK, uh, but uh, MM1 or MMC or MM infinity uh, uh, server. So its output, its output actually produces again uh, exponential distribution. So it's nicely composable. Um, yeah, but actually, in reality, uh, it's slightly different. Uh, the, I, I don't know uh, whether, or I'm quite sure, uh, the input uh, stack can be modeled uh, as an exponential distribution uh, because most uh, requests take some constant time. So I, here, I put here the M bar symbol. And that also affects uh, the distribution that we get at the output of this model. So at the input of the critical section, you wouldn't have a, a memorialized distribution, but some a, another distribution, M double bar, and the critical section, uh, as was in my picture, so I had, it was not random, it was just some constant amount of work, so uh, here is D. And again, a similar situation as before, uh, M uh, three bars, uh, not a exponential distribution, and D uh, as a constant amount of work. Uh, and the output. So yeah, uh, and uh, unfortunately, my queuing theory uh, skills and knowledge uh, are not sufficient uh, to uh, analyze this uh, analytically. So yeah, so then I get down to the experiments. Uh, yeah, I had some okay. Uh, I had some uh, conjectures about the behavior. Uh, first is that. Uh, if if we uh, throttle uh, 
work of spin lock. So it would uh, reduce the throughput, the throughput of the server processing its request uh, more, more than linearly. I mean, uh, the example, if, uh, for example, a server at the beginning consumes 400% uh, percent of CPU uh, time, and we would throttle it with quota to 200% CPU time, so we would get uh, less than half the throughput because uh, some of uh, the parts of the work are uh, in the critical section and there is the queue and the queued, uh, queued uh, workers uh, take away useful CPU time. Um, so we should see less. And now the question is, I uh, should have started the survey already. There is now, again, it's a survey slide. Start a poll. There are three options. Uh, uh -huh. I can even name them one to three. One to three. So the question is: uh, we have uh, we, we, we have the server that uh, when it's unthrottled it takes four hundred of uh, CPU time. We throttled it uh, artificially to two hundred uh, percent of CPU time. And the question is: uh, the throughput of uh, the server is, that is available uh, will be less than the half of the initial one, exactly half, or like exactly like mm, I mean, within the, some uh, margin of error, or more than one half actually, so that the throttling maybe uh, would be inefficient or something. So what are your opinions on this? So I will now run the poll running uh, for a bit. And uh, then there was a second conjecture that actually now we are talking about just one single uh, server that is under throttling uh, and that the shared section is shared only by the workers of the server. But the problem, no, no, yeah, problem is uh, that uh, the shared section might not be just inside the server, uh, but it might be some of the system components, um, uh, like in some looks in the kernel. And that means that some other uh, processes that are not supposed to be throttled would some, from time to time, uh, would wait for this uh, uh, resource, for this uh, uh, mutex or spin lock. So the question is, uh, or the conjecture, uh, whether or what will be the impact they will see on the waiting times on, on this uh, uh, locking primitive. Uh, so, and somehow quantified it, uh, whether it's uh, just proportional or uh, the time to the throttling. So, uh, yeah, I will move to the next slide um, and I will publish the results. Uh, so, uh, most of the folks uh, think that it will be actually slower than one half of the original uh, original rate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So we will see later. Remember. Here, uh, this, the, previously we had the graphs from the theory. Now these are the graphs from the reality. Uh, so at the x-axis we have the arrival rate and uh, at the y-axis we have the metric uh, metrics that we were interested in. So again, uh, there is the latency. We see uh, there is almost like no latency additional only when the server is uh, uh, saturated and then when it's overloaded, uh, the latency is even bigger. And the drop rate, so we see when uh, here it actually is, uh, the arrival rate was double the processing rate. So we see that uh, even uh, slightly more than one half of the requests is dropped, which makes sense. We are uh, overall, we have overloaded the, overall the server. Uh, and on the bottom graph, we see the throughput uh, scales nicely, and also the CPU utilization. Uh, we see that on these 48 machines, that the blue line, uh, 48 CPUs machine, uh, that we cannot get more than 48 CPUs. And uh, so this is just how to read this plot. Uh, here's more interesting. Uh, the scaling, uh, the first picture was without any locking inside the server. Here, I, uh, there is a locking. So we can see that the throughput at the bottom plot uh, actually uh, scales well until it reaches uh, this bending point and then it uh, doesn't scale up. Hmm, interesting, maybe, uh, and also the latency, uh, latency grows as well uh, uh, and drops. So uh, maybe you already know this or have heard about this uh, incarnation of Amdahl's law that tell us, tells us how uh, tells us how uh, faster can we go if we uh, multiply uh, the number of available CPUs. Uh, so uh, yeah, here, uh, I, the, the constant I could have, it was under my control. The amount of work that's done in the critical section was 8%. So uh, the uh, maximum maximum uh, multiplicator of uh, the basic throughput would be two and a half times, which was something what we saw in the graph. So that was with the mutex. 
here. It's uh, the same uh, uh, use case, but with the uh, with the spin lock. And we can see, uh, or actually we cannot see it, so I put it here in the numbers uh, that the at the point when the arrival rate was around 12, which uh, uh, which was. Uh, the, the ideal uh, from the Amdahl's law. Uh, actually, the server has throughput only 9.9, and <laughs> CPU utilization uh, was uh, 26.5, which means uh, that lots of work was just burned on the spin locks. And we can see that yeah, the throughput didn't grow higher. That's same with the that's same with the mutex case, but uh, we see that uh, the the CPU load. Uh, was uh, yeah, was uh, saturated uh, much earlier. Uh, for the comparison here uh, with the mutexes, uh, we see that basically the CPU load uh, is correlated very well with the throughput, because yeah, there is the waiting tasks do, do don't waste don't consume CPU time. So uh, this was yeah this the theoretical graphs now in the practice and now now I'm uh, <laughs> the exclamation mark here. Uh, it's uh, inverted. Now, the arrival rate is constant. The lambda is constant. Uh, that means we have some uh, yeah, incoming rate of requests. And a quota is uh, changed. Uh, that may, means perhaps like the processing rate. Uh, but I, uh, to be sure, I wrote here quota. Uh, so on this picture, we can see that yeah uh what's important here is uh, the increase in latency at the bottom or sorry at the top uh, top graph uh where we see that if we apply the quota that is above uh the yeah above the needed uh, cpu time so uh, nothing happens but uh, around here at the point uh when the C we would need 12 uh, cpus or 12 and a half uh we see that again latency starts race racing and this is the in the case of the simple uh, simple server with no locking and uh, yeah um this is uh, with no locking here it's a uh, similar where we uh, where we are throttling the mutex case, uh, so yeah, it has no impact when we are above the needed CPU power. Uh, but yeah, it increases the effects latencies. And the, yeah, uh, th this thing which I was uh, waiting waiting for uh, is the case uh, with the spin locks. So we see that this bend on the graph is actually it starts around the thirty two. Uh, CPU quota, 32 CPUs, uh, and it starts growing uh, because, as we saw previously, uh, there is lots of uh, useless work. Uh, and here, uh, again, it is not visible in the picture. So, in in theory, according to the theory, the quota of uh, 12 CPUs uh, should be sufficient, or uh, actually the, in the calculation it was 20, 12, 12 and a half, so it should be not, not sufficient, but uh, it should not have that big impact. Uh, and uh, here in the graph, uh, the arrival it was 11.4, but we already dropped with the threshold to 3.43, which is uh, very bad. And uh, it's very bad, but actually the question is, uh, is it worse than we expected? And uh, my answer is, and that it's not worse. That it actually scales as was expected because uh, even the server without throttling uh, did not achieve uh, the the throughput that uh, the mutex uh, server could achieve. So. So it depends, uh, 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 or if we take the server with the with, with consumes four hundred of uh, CPU time, and it's the spin lock one, and we reduce it to two hundred, uh, the throughput would reduce to half as well. Uh, this is, yeah, in the graph it's visible like that. These um, purple squares are on line. Uh, 
But the problem is that this uh, Spinlock server with 400 CPUs cannot handle, in our case, uh, incoming rate of four. It is actually already at this point, it would be handling much lower incoming rate. So when it's uh, lowered uh, to the half, uh, it will be half of this low rate. So uh, in my interpretation, the answer to the survey question is the number two, that it reduces proportionally to the one half. And uh, the surprising effect I thought that would be there uh, wasn't there. Uh, I mean, that the waiters would, uh, ex yeah, one can think about it, that the waiters consume the CPU time, but actually uh, also the, the incoming incoming rate of the rater, waiters is also slowed down. So it, it's, it evens out. Uh, yeah, and the second conjecture, okay, I didn't model, didn't measure it, so mm, I cannot tell anything about it. Uh, quick conclusion. Yeah, so uh, what I've learned that the queuing theory, uh, it provides some uh, nice models, simplified, but uh, I think they are not very well applicable to real world or uh, they get very quickly complex. Uh, so if anyone has uh, more experience with queuing theory, uh, this is a cold question, uh, get out, uh, reach out to me. Um, then I liked, I liked uh, the container that I could move it between the machines of my server during the debugging phase. And yeah, one interesting point is uh, how would spin logs in the kernel that cannot be preempted when they are spinning uh, behave uh, in this regard. Uh, I hope they would behave similarly in the current kernels, but yeah, it's not verified. So um, that is all. Yeah, here is a, a list of references I've used uh, for my work, or uh, there are some uh, codes, and uh, that is all. I'm slightly over time. Hello, uh, it's me again. I came here to correct or complement some ex the experiments that I presented previously, where I made the conclusion, conclusion that uh, throughput scales linearly with applied quota. So I actually uh, realized that it's not completely true and that it depends on some other factors. And in this short addendum, I will quickly explain uh, why it's different. So first, uh, uh, let's start with a theoretical model when we have the model for spin lock, uh, sing a single spin lock that uh, has the critical sections and the waiters that are waiting in the queue actually consume the available CPU bandwidth. That means that the effective processing rate is uh, divided by the total number of uh, CPUs that are involved here. So if uh, there is uh, no one waiting, there is just uh, one CPU in the critical section, we divide it uh, by one, so that's uh, the full full bandwidth, but then we slow down based on the queue. So we have this model. So how does it behave uh, if we look at it as a model? So here uh, at the x-axis, we have the arrival rate, and on the y-axis, we have throughput. And we can see that actually, uh, as we increase the arrival rate, uh, and the more spinners uh, reduce the CPU bandwidth, so actually the available throughput uh, gets down. And if the, it's more significant, the more CPUs we have. That's the number K we have here in the plot. So, and we can see that it, it's uh, yeah, sub, sublinear, uh, the throughput is sublinear, but here it's depending on the arrival rate. Uh, so that's uh, one point. Now, that we, we are varying arrival rate. Now, uh, what happens when we vary the processing rate? That basically means when we apply the quota to a constant uh, influx of the request. So here, that's the linear line, which was my previous uh, statement, and how this spin lock model would behave here. So let's check it. So we can see that it actually depends on the number of CPUs, and uh, it can be both above or below the line. If we look at the case when we have lots of CPUs, so it behaves linearly. You can see that it's, that's what I claimed previously. It, I was basically just looking at this case with lots of CPUs uh, or with uh, overloaded server. So it scales nicely linearly. If we reduce, if we reduce the quota ten times from uh, ten to one, we see that the throughput goes down linearly. Although it's not the full available throughput, but still it goes down linearly. But it's different if we have 
uh, less CPUs where the effects are not so pronounced. And here it actually depends. Uh, uh, we can, if we scale the throughput from 10 to 1, it is above the dashed line that's linear. So uh, we see that the throughput after throttling can still be uh, above the linear proportional like rate. So that was uh, what I wanted to clarify that it actually depends, uh, even with this model, it depends on the number of CPUs that are taking away the CPU time when they are waiting. And, uh, and also, if we look at the CPU usage that predicts this model, we can see that actually as we apply the quota, we go with the processing rate down. So at some moment, we actually increase the CPU usage for the constant arrival rate because uh, we actually make the critical section more, more contented and the contenders uh, contenders contribute to the CPU usage. So there is this peak or spike uh, in CPU usage, but it's uh, always it's below the quota. The, it, we don't break the quota in the theory, uh, but uh, we cause some CPU usage uh, race. So this was uh, visually the model. Here are the formulas that I've used for it. Uh, this is just for reference. And uh, here is the picture uh, that I measured uh, with the stuff that I described and I reduced the arrival rate so that I could get to this uh, zone where this could be visible. And indeed, uh, it was visible. We can see that the throughput, uh, if we look at the throughput where it starts bending, so it's actually sublinear. So that was the case. Uh, uh, it was an interesting case in the previous plot uh, where it, it, it at the beginning it drops quicker, then, then it's uh, again linear. Uh, so Previously, I was looking only at this zone, but we can see that there is this initial drop. And also, interestingly, we can see that the CPU usage actually uh, actually raised slightly around uh, this uh, critical section, or sorry, critical critical value, where the quota is approximately uh, just about enough for the for this given constant arrival rate. So yeah, I think the CPU usage was something like 6.2 and here the peak was 6.6. .6. So uh, it's not that much, but it's uh, measurable. So here, uh, this is all from this correction slides. And uh, the th thing to remember is that actually uh, applying quota to spin lock can have these uh, various effects.